The 10 Minute University is a program of Clackamas County Master Gardener Association offered in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. At our website, you'll find handouts, videos, upcoming classes, and workshops. Our program is volunteer led and we are supported by OSU faculty to ensure the quality of our content. Today's presentation is the third and final in a series on helping you grow your homegrown tomatoes. Today, we're gonna to focus on getting the plant into the garden and learning the best practices to keep it a healthy plant through the season so that you can have raised and harvested the best tomatoes ever. It is estimated that over 90% of the home gardeners want to grow and do grow tomatoes. And it's no wonder it's such a versatile and tasty, flavorful vegetable that has so many uses in your home uh, menus and cooking. Um, but unfortunately, it's not an easy plant to raise. Uh, it's, uh, there's many challenges that you as the home gardener face as you uh, work to get it through the summer into harvest. There's questions about pruning and watering and fertilizing, and then only to face diseases and disorders that uh, can make it so that the hopeful harvest that you were looking for uh, isn't there and, and it, it, it can be discouraging. But today's session is going to focus on all those concerns that you might have and uh, help you to get through to uh, have the best season yet in growing your tomato. So let's get started. Today's objectives, you're gonna learn when you're gonna put the tomato start in the garden. What are the best ways to support a large tomato? How to manage your plant for better health and better fruit. How to prune, water and fertilize. How to identify and manage tomato diseases and disorders. How best to meet weather challenges, environmental problems, and insect pests, and how to maximize the production and get an early harvest. So first, let's start about, oh, when should I be putting it out? Now, as I've driven around our area, I can see that people have already put tomatoes in a couple of weeks ago, and yet I know there are many people waiting until the traditional memorial time. The question is, you need to look at your own microclimate and say, is it a good time to put my tomato in? And if you follow these rules, I think you can be make a good choice. First of all, make sure your soil is in good workable condition. Uh, and there've been lessons and, and seminars on soil. So if you're wondering what that means, uh, you can refer back to those. But basically uh, it's not mucky and wet and, and uh, you can work it and have it crumble in your hands. You wanna make sure that the danger of frost is passed and that your nighttime temperatures are not gonna go below 50. You also, if you can find a soil thermometer, ought to check to make sure that your soil temperature is 60 degrees. Uh, here in Western Oregon, that happens usually around the middle to end of May. So you've determined that uh, it's time to, you, you think you can start putting them out in a couple of weeks. You need to plan ahead because you don't wanna take this plant from your nurturing environment of your home or the nursery where you just picked it up and stick it out in the garden. It's too big of a shock. You want to harden it off or acclimate it to the outside uh, environment. This is a process that'll take you 10 to 14 days and you slowly over time, uh, increasing each day an hour or two, uh, can increase the exposure that your plant has. So it will be used to lower temperatures uh, and humidity and increased sunlight. So you've determined now that your soil is 60 degrees, you've hardened the plant, you finished that, and now you wanna put it out in the garden. Let's begin by making sure it's well hydrated. And then you've figured out where you're gonna put it and you've got it spaced uh, places where you can put it, where they'll be spaced out two to three feet apart if you've got that much space and four to five feet uh, between rows. But you're gonna put it in and you say now, uh, how do I put it? There are two, two methods we recommend, either the trench or the vertical. The trench looks like this. You've dug only down about six to eight inches and you've removed the leaves up quite a ways and you lay the plant on the side. You've got a nice long trough here that you're putting your plant in that's fairly shallow. 
The nice thing is if you look at here, these are all going to become coming the growing roots out of this area where it's just a stem right now once it's buried in the soil. So that is the trench plant in, in brief. And the vertical is simply that where you dig a much deeper hole, almost twice the depth, 10 to 12 inches. And you'll, we're gonna wanna remove some of the lower leaves here and you're gonna plant it at the depth of 10 to 12 inches. Well, so which one do you want to use? Let's talk about it and, and make some comparisons. The nice thing about the trench is you can uh, put it in a little, when you put it in in the early season, the soil that is uh, not as deep obviously will be warmer and it can initially speed the plant growth. Compare that with the vertical where the cooler soil will be surrounding the roots because it's much deeper. So it will initially slow the growth of the plant. Now, in the summer, the problem with the trench is that it's uh, fairly shallow and the roots can dry out much faster. So you'll have to maintain and water uh, that probably more than the vertical. In the summer, uh, the vertical one has roots that are go much deeper and there's more water accessible that they can draw on. Thing to remember is if you have bought a grafted tomato, don't use either one of these. You follow the directions that the grafter has indicated and not bury it below the graft. When I mentioned about burying this, the uh, stem and the growing roots, that's because of the principle of adventitious roots, which is the, the uh, tomato has. And that means that every time the stem is in contact with soil, it will send out and develop roots. A healthy plant has a good healthy root system. And each time that you have potted up, hopefully before now, uh, you've managed to get some of that. And as you plant it, plant it deep. You can see here in the trench how uh, many uh, roots have developed. That's going to be a healthy tomato. Well, now you've got it in the ground, it's important to think about how you're gonna support that plant. And that is through staking. And that's very, very important. You've got lots of options. You can see here a whole collection of cages and fences and rods and poles. Look over here, this is a huge plant and that needs a lot of support. You can see there's uh, wooden stakes as well as a cage. See how large that is. You need to support your plant. Sturdy is the key word. Well, why do you want to stake it? It saves garden space, avoids having the plants crowded. You can see these are kind of pretty close here and need to be uh, staked. Why do you support it? It gets a little more sunlight in. More sunlight means you're going to have bigger, sweeter, and earlier fruit. You also have a healthier plant. If you have a plant like the tomato in indeterminate, which is basically a vine, it will just scatter and uh, stretch over the soil and you'll have leaves that are going to be a uh, root for disease and insects to go right up your plant. Keep it off of the ground uh, and you do that by supporting it. How to do it? Well, here's a use of a stake and you put it in at the time of the, uh, when you're planting and you can see how here the, the ties have been sort of made into a loop. And the advantage of that is you don't have the stem rubbing up against the wooden or uh, metal pole. So it gives a little bit of space, but you do want to tie it and that helps to train the plant to grow tall and upright. Lots of opportunities and lots of options for ways that you can support your plant with ladders and trellises, cages, rods, espalier, and tri uh, tripods, lots of interesting ways of doing it. Uh, here's just a basic cage that'll hold your tomato. And these are what we use quite often, our PVC pipes we put together using the joints and pipes. That's a very sturdy cage. So you know that you need to have a structure that'll support the plant. You know the what about supporting it. And you know the how, the word is sturdy. Now the question is, when? When do you support it? Well, you put it in as soon as you plant. If you um, put your tomato in the ground and then come back two weeks later, you're going to, by putting in this, the uh, stakes and the cages, you're possibly going to damage the roots that have already begun to spread out. So put the, all your structures in the day that you plant your tomato. Now the question is watering your tomatoes. Well, the most important thing to remember is to keep the water off of the fruit and foliage. You want a system that will allow it to be watered at the base. So your soaker hoses here, there's spritzers where you have a main line of irrigation water and small hoses with a spritzer at each end for the plant. 
And there's some very creative ways you can come and, and do it with uh, do it yourself in system. The main thing is you want to minimize the risk of disease with a drip irrigation. Maintain uniform moisture level, very important. So you're going to soak your plant thoroughly once a week, every seven to 10 days. And it's important that you don't just go out and water every day a little bit. You don't want small amounts and only going to hit the top of the roots. You want that water to go deep. So soak thoroughly once a week. And the amount should be about an inch of water a week, which amounts to in volume about three gallons per plant. Deep watering helps the plant build a strong root system. Inconsistent irrigation leads to fruit cracking or blossom and rot. And we'll talk about both of those later on in the program, but it is due largely to this inconsistency. Heavy mulching will preserve the soil moisture. Now there's one thing to be thinking about and that is when your plant is starting to have ripening tomatoes, you wanna to pull back on the watering because watering will enter the tomato and cause it to split. The skin just won't be able to hold all that moisture. And you're also diluting the flavoring of that plant, uh, of the tomato. So as, it, as you're getting toward the ripening season, pull back on watering. Well, fertilizing is always a, a something to consider too, how to do that best. You're, you're going to notice here that OSU recommends one to one ratio. And that means that's the nitrogen is one, the phosphorus is two, and the potassium is three. What you don't want is a huge tree with lots of green leaves. You want tomatoes, which are the flowers and fruit. That's why the heavier, higher dosage, high ratio of the phosphorus. How to fertilize? Well, start before you're gonna plant. You could go out now if your soil will allow you and work some compost into the soil. Get that in there worked in. And then a couple of weeks later when you're planting, you're going to add a handful of one to two ounces of this particular uh, ratio. And you'll find it, it may be five, 10, five, the numbers may vary, but the ratio should be one to two to one. Put that in each planting hole. When the fruit is set, now this means that the pollination is completed, you'll wanna add another uh, fertilization by doing a side dressing around the plant, two to three tablespoons around the drip line of the plant. How do you do that? You pull back the mulch, gently work the fertilizer into the soil, then rewater it and replace the mulch. You'll want to continue to fertilize about every three to four weeks. Again, it's most important to avoid high nitrogen fertilizer. It's just going to grow leaves and not fruit. And again, it'll cause the blossom end rot. Well, to summarize, here we go. Fertilizing. One month before planting, put compost into your ground. At planting, place a handful of one to two to one and work it deep into the soil. When the fruit is set, and that is pollination is completed, continue with fertilizer with a high phosphorus. And repeat one month later, again, with a low nitrogen fertilizer. Now I wanna talk briefly about mulching. It's, we could have a whole program on it because it's a lot to learn here, but basically I wanna encourage you to use a lot of mulch around your, your garden plants, especially your tomatoes. Mulching can prevent loss of moisture. It suppresses weed growth. It'll reduce uh, the leaching out of fertilizer. It'll keep it, the ground cool in the summer if it gets to be really hot. It'll reduce soil erosion. It'll help keep water off the leaves and thus preventing disease. And any fruits that fall down, it'll keep them away from the plant. It'll improve the structure of the soil as it breaks down if you're using an organic one. And it prevents soil compaction and crusting on the surface. And nice thing is it makes your garden look a little more pleasing and uniform. I like it because it manages weeds. Now we have a couple of ways of thinking about mulching your plants. You can use an organic one, such as be straw or, or grass clippings, and lay that uh, not uh, along the ground and close to the plant. Uh, you can also use um, plastic mulching, uh, either black or red. If you put this on the ground a couple of weeks ahead of time, it'll warm the soil tremendously and you might even be able to get your plants in a little earlier. Just cut a hole and put your plant in it. There's the black and the red. How to mulch your plant. Now this is for the organic. 
you're going to spread a two inch layer around your tomato plants. Then you're going to pull back a layer about a one to two inches from around the tomato stem. So you have a little well. You don't want the, the uh, mulch right up against the stem because that can contribute to a stem rot. We know that with even planting trees and any other plants, you don't want your mulch right up against uh, the, the stem or the trunk. And that little well will make a little dish for the water to, to kind of stay in easier. If you have plenty of extra mulch, uh, put it around the rows between the, it'll just help keep the weeds down. And be sure that you water your plant. You can check it by uh, testing it with your finger or a, a moisture gauge. Uh, something to be aware of. If you're using an organic mulch, uh, you want to wait a little while before you put it down. Remember the black plastic was already down so the soil was warm, but mulching will cool the soil. So if you're putting it down early, right after you've planted it, that mulching, that insulation will keep the soil cool and it may actually delay the growth of your plant if you're cooling the soil. Well, now let's get to pruning, which is uh, always can be a puzzle uh, because it, there are ways of doing it and it's also very important for your plant. Why do you wanna do it? Well, look here at the, if it's not done, we've got nice sturdy wooden cages that are falling over. The plant is so big and so huge that the growth is out of control. Also, when you prune it, you can allow a lot of air and light to get down into the center of the plant and keep the plant healthier. If you prune your plant, good, you can get less tomatoes, but they'll be much larger and nice. So you can get larger fruits by pruning your plant. And it's a lot easier to reach in and pick them too, if it's been pruned and, and more open. Well, which plants do you Prune. Do you prune all tomato plants? Not necessarily. If you've planted an indeterminate, that's a vine type of tomato, pruning is strongly advised. And otherwise, the vine will just continue to grow and grow and you'll get a 10 foot plant uh, and not as many tomatoes. You want the energy focused on the fruit, producing fruit. And so that's why you prune an indeterminate. If you're growing a determinate, and you're going to find that out by looking at the label, it'll tell you whether it's a determinate. The indeterminates are more of a vine. The, de the determinants are a, a bush plant. And generally, you don't need to uh, prune a determinant because it, it'll grow uh, a more controlled growth, more of a uh, bush. And the other thing is, if you look here, the tomatoes grow at the end of the branch. And so if you're going to prune the branch, you're going to cut down on the tomato production and you won't have as many. Let's look at the pl tomato plant structure now. Um, Here's the stem and the leaves that come off. Notice the first flower cluster that's developed. And notice also this growth right here, which is known as a sucker. That's kind of develops between the main leaf and the stem. And that's a sucker. And we're going to talk about pruning using uh, taking out suckers. When to prune? Well, you've got your plant in. Uh, when it gets to be about 12 to 18 inches tall, which may not be very far down the road from your early planting, uh, you need to start looking to prune. And then you need to maintain it weekly by checking and pruning and checking for any new growth and suckers. You may not take off everything, uh, take very much off every week, but you do need to be checking it. You'll always want to take off broken or diseased stems, branches, or leaves. Four types of pruning, simple, Missouri, root, and topping. So let's talk about those. Pruning, basically, you're trying to keep the plant from uh, to keep under control. And one of the things that gets out of control are the growth of suckers. So you take those off and it helps the stem to maintain and uh, focus its energy on the growth. And uh, it doesn't uh, weigh the plant so much. So that's a simple prune. You've just gone right in there and snipped it out. Now you can see here where if we're removing the lower branches, here's that first um, set of flowers, you won't get any tomatoes developing below that. That's your first set. So you can take those leaves off because they're just gonna hang down and probably get into the dirt or they'll have some water splash from where you're spritzing here. So take those off. There, and there's the Missouri printing pruning. And that's for um, those of us who went on vacation and came back and saw that the suckers were huge and really gonna be hard to take out. Look at, if I cut that off there, that's gonna be a huge wound 
and the stem. And so I don't want to do that. That could introduce some disease or at least risk of it. So I'm going to take off just up a, up a ways so I don't have that wound in the stem, but I did get rid of the sucker. Then toward the end of the season, if you're trying to want to hasten the ripening your tomatoes a little bit, you want to stress the plant by doing a root print pruning. And you can see we're away, a distance away from the plant. We're just getting into some of the peripheral roots, but we're going to put a sharp instrument down there and just sever some of those roots. And that will stress the plant a little bit. And when a plant is stressed, it hastens itself towards ripening. Again, toward the end of the season, root pruning. And that's only done on one side. Then at the, again, at the end of the season, you've got a plant that's maybe growing five to six feet. You're going to take out the growing part and top that. That'll stop that from growing and can hasten ripening as well. Now, there's some interesting ways for you to think about um, your, your pruning. You're going to try to train it with your uh, stakes. And you're going to prune it so that you have either a single liter or two liters. Sometimes I manage to get three if I'm not paying enough attention early and it happens, that's what I end up with. But I'm training my plant on the stake to grow and I do that by pruning and tying. Then you wanna always make sure that you're keeping your plant growing inside the cage. So try to prune out things that grow beyond the cage. And let's go back and remove those suckers. I, I want you to know that I can tell the quality of the hydration of my plant. I like to just pinch these with my fingers, uh, fingernail. And if it snaps off crisp, I know my plant's well hydrated. If it's, if it's not, it's hard to, it seems a little stringy and hard to get off a little limp, then I know I haven't hydrated my, my tomato well enough. But that is a sucker. This is a much larger sucker. You see, it's kind of gotten out of control. This would be a Missouri printing, printing where you're just going to cut right there and, and not down here. That's a huge wound if you cut there. Now, also, we talked about topping the plant when it gets too high. Get rid of that when it's above its supports. It's important if it's you've uh, left the pruning and you come in toward the end of the season and it's a little out of control and you start cutting back a lot, your heavy pruning can cause some damage. Uh, it'll expose tomatoes and you'll end up with a sun scald or sunburn if, if the ones the leaves above the fruit are removed. So be careful for um, mid to late summer pruning. Again, once you've uh, finished pruning, check your fertilizing schedule and make sure if it's time that the, uh, the plant will uh, enjoy having an extra shot of fertilizer. So here we are with a pruning time schedule. One to two weeks after transplanting, prune off the foliage touching the ground. Two to four weeks after transplanting or when flowering begins, remove all small suckers and leaves below the first flower cluster. Six to eight weeks after transplanting, remove the branches that are growing outside the cage and the support system. And four weeks before the normal date, before the first frost that you can anticipate, it's good to top the plant. This would be for the indeterminate variety. And then if you've had a frost, you might as well consider removing the green fruit and to ripen indoors. Now let's talk about pollination. The nice thing about tomatoes is that they are self-pollinating, means it's a perfect flower. And within that flower, both the male and female parts are located. And so uh, we don't need bees uh, to do it. The plant, if the weather's good, the plant will self-pollinate. However, sometimes we get extreme temperatures that might uh, interrupt the pollination system. It might be too humid because the uh, pollen can't uh, travel well, or it's too dry and it won't stick. Those are uh, could be reasons why you're not seeing the pollination you'd like. But guess what? You can go out there and assist with it. Um, I like to walk the vine, just kind of shake the cage a little bit because all it does is uh, just a gentle shake will cause it to the pollen to drop. If you've got time with the paintbrush, have at it. I'm sure that that would help with fertilization too. If you'll only have a few plants that you could do that. We hear people that talk about, oh my, the blossoms are dropping off. What causes that? Well, there are some that we can't control and some things we can. The environment could be one reason where you're getting a really hot temperature, cooler than 55 or hotter than 100, or maybe it's very windy and it will blow those blossoms off. But we might be contributing too by using too much nitrogen in the fertilizer, or we're doing a bad job of managing our watering. Maybe we're doing too much or too little. 
there are a few diseases too that could cause that uh, for the blossoms to drop. I hear people tell me that, uh, well, they never even saw any flowers. And uh, what would cause that? Well, there can be diseases and pests, but again, a large percentage of it has to do with if you fed that and you have a giant tree with lots of nice green leaves, you've used too much nitrogen. Perhaps it's too hot, or perhaps you don't have it where there's a lot of good sun. Now we do face increasing weather challenges as the climate changes. One of the things we faced here in our area is a heat wave. What to do if that happens? Well, go back and think about mulching. And if you increase the mulch around the plant, mulch heavily, and then increase, change your watering schedule to do it two times a week during that time so the plant stays well hydrated. You can also try to shade it by uh, making a screen over the top or a shade cloth. It will keep the plant a little cooler. Hot weather problems create problems in your tomatoes. And uh, you can give a, a poor fruit set or delay in ripening, or some of the fruit will start to look funny. You might have this white core that you see in a tomato or um, yellow shouldered fruit or blossom end rot. Hot weather can cause problems. If you are planting in a pot, you may want to watch out because you'll have to water more frequently than what we've suggested for the open garden. Potted plants are vulnerable to drought stress, and that's what the leaf looks, shows like here. This is a plant under drought stress. Sometimes we get nighttime chills, and a, the tomato doesn't really care for those. And if you are planting early, you might consider using especially a row cover or a cloche, um, just something, this is quite a fancy one, but it, it's made so that it has slits and uh, it'll uh, lets air in, and you can reach in and pollinate by shaking the plants. Well, now let's talk about the problems that we face sometimes. There are basically three ways to think of the diseases as far as what causes them. Um, there is, the tomato problems are diseases, pests, and the growing conditions. Think about it as a, uh, the disease triangle where you have the host plant and the pathogen and the environment. And the host plant, of course, is our tomato. And the pathogens are many. And the environment is something that looks like this, where we don't have it uh, very well managed for moisture and we weeds. And so this allows, this environment allows a lot of pests and disease to, to thrive. But if you can manage the host and the pathogens and the environment, you can control all, all of these and you won't have any disease. So let's talk about a solution. What's your solution for the host? Get a tomato that's resistant to disease. And you'll notice when you either buy seeds or when you see the steak that's on the tomato plant you're buying, you'll be able to see if it's disease resistant. Check it. That's a good thing to do. There are more and more of the tomato plants now developed are, um, are highly resistant to diseases. Pathogens, you can also um, plant at the right time. If you put your tomato in at a less than optimal temperatures, maybe you put it in kind of early, you're stressing that plant and it will be uh, more susceptible to having pathogens move in. Another way to, to uh, try to minimize the risk of any pathogens is to rotate your plants, put in, uh, avoid up the buildup that occurs when you put tomatoes in the same place year after year after year. So you do that by rotating the plants. Why do you do that? Well, it helps so that your soil doesn't become depleted. A tomato loves calcium and it'll deplete that calcium. And if you don't re uh, replenish that sufficiently, um, it'll, you'll have a plant with lacking that calcium. Rotating will also help can maintain a good soil structure. If you can put a root crop in where you had tomatoes last year or this year, then next year, the soil will be better for another different plant. And the best thing is it'll keep uh, soil-borne pests from getting a foothold in your garden. They'll wait on winter over and be there ready to attack your tomato again. And every year you'll see the tomato in that same spot become a little less, less vigorous. It's not easy to rotate plants. Many of us don't have a large enough garden and we can choose a sunny spot in three different places. So here's some suggestions. Again, if uh, we've talked about avoiding plants in, the, in this family, um, they all will are susceptible to the same soil-borne diseases. So if you can do it, 
uh, you've got limited space, you can use pots or uh, you can remove some of the top of the soil and replace it with new soil. And you can also plant a grafted tomato because generally the rootstock used and the grafted is uh, resistant to soil borne diseases. Now, the third thing was to control the environment. And you can do that by planting in compost rich soil that's well drained with adequate moisture. And that means you've taken care of it, um, adding the amendments needed. You also can have a good environment with, um, without problems without inviting problems by keeping your garden clean and removing a lot of this debris at the end of the season and rotating the plants. Now let's talk about things that you're going to see as you're getting close to uh, harvest. You're going to see some of the fruit may have some interesting uh, characteristics. This one is green shoulders, sometimes also yellow shoulders, and they're called by, it's caused by high temperatures. And you can uh, minimize that by remembering to leave some uh, foliage above the fruit so that it will shield the, the uh, tomato from the sun. Now we talked about blossom end rot. This is a huge problem and it'll ruin the whole tomato. It is caused by calcium deficiency uh, and also mostly lack of water or inconsistent watering. Um, some of my varieties I've noticed, uh, as such as the Romas, seem more susceptible. But let's talk a minute here about if you're going to add calcium or lime, but you don't water consistently, the calcium will just sit there. You have to have the watering that's consistent to bring up the calcium into the plant and into the tomato. So uh, it's, it's kind of a package deal here. You need to have the right amount of calcium, but you also have to have the watering to bring up the calcium into the plant. Here's another uh, disorder uh, late in the season of blight, and it's caused by a fungus uh, brought in airborne pathogens. Again, this is the reason to keep moisture off of your uh, tomato, your plants, and your leaves as it thrives on a moist surface. And when you see it, you want to remove whatever's infected. Early in the season, and this is the reason to harden it off, is that if you stick it out and it's uh, in the process of developing flowers and it's a chilly night, you may end up with this cat face, very distorted tomato. Uh, also herbicide damage can cause that particular disorder. Here again is the tomato where we watered it um, as it was ripening and we get a cracking or a splitting. Uneven moisture. And we saw the sun scald uh, where we've, if we've taken the leaves away that are above it, you can uh, end up with a sun scald. So avoid excessive pruning above the fruit. Now let's talk about the leaves. The leaves can show signs of, of distress too and difficulty. Here you see leaves that are wilted, caused by a bacterial or fungal disease. Now here's leaves that are showing a discoloration pattern they may be yellow or uh, discolored, and those are caused by nutritional deficiencies. Some of these uh, nutrients are missing, nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, manganese, or magnesium. We could spend a whole tomato session on that, but instead I'm going to urge you to uh, look up some of the places. I found one here, and there's many more that tell you uh, what each particular deficiency looks like. They're not all the same. And you need to know before you do anything, you don't want to just start throwing things in the soil. You need to know what the deficiency is. Well, how do you, if this seems a little overwhelming, there's easy ways to minimize the risk of these nutrient disorders. First of all, just use what we've talked about for what's a good growing condition for your soil and your watering and uh, the sunlight and modify your fertilizing practices. Remember, you're going to want to use a super phosphate and low in nitrogen. And thirdly, get a soil test. Um, we'll be doing that at the Spring Garden Fair this weekend. Your tomato needs a pH of 6.2 to 6.8. That's a slightly acidic. And the important thing about pH is it provides the environment for the nutrient use of plants' ability to use the nutrients. I can put all the right things in the soil, but if my soil pH is wrong, it won't be allow the plant to bring up all those nutrients. So this is the basic environment, the pH 6.2 to 6.8, and get your soil tested because then you're likely that your soil will have all the nutrients that it needs and you won't have the problem of nutrient deficiency. 
Another problem with leaves is could be uh, distorted by herbicide exposure when it blows in the wind and uh, brings it into your yard and garden. You also might see leaves curling and this uh, can be upsetting, but it's really, uh, it's a plant's way to kind of protect itself. Uh, it, during the summer days when it gets really hot, there's a process called transpiration where the leaves uh, with the heat and the wind may lose a lot of moisture and it's just trying to protect itself by curling up. And then that way it doesn't expose itself to as much moisture loss. If you see this in the afternoon on a hot day, wait until the morning and go out and see if the leaves have opened up and you're back to a normal looking leaf. Then you'll know it's just its way of protecting itself, a physiological leaf roll. Well, there are, you've got some bacterial disease here with the spots on the leaves. And got somebody eating these leaves. There's a lot of holes in the foliage and there could be aphids or insects that are attacking it. Sometimes you might pick a tomato, especially an heirloom. And as you see the bottom of it, you say, whoa, what's causing this? That's not a problem. That's just a, some kind of a characteristic of some heirlooms called blossom scar. Now we hear people who say, oh, the leaves are turning yellow. Well, here's can be a lot of things that can cause that. If the leaves are yellow just at the bottom, that's just a normal stage in the cycle. But if they're up at the top, you might think, am I giving it too much water or not enough? If the soil's compacted, it's not gonna be able to get the water, or perhaps you do have a disease that's moved in or a nutrient de deficiency, or maybe just not enough sun to reach the leaves. Again, that's another reason for pruning to keep the foliage in control. But here you see a nice tomatoes growing and there's le yellow leaves at the bottom, but we're the green up higher. So this just shows you, this is a normal stage in the growth of the, that plant. Well, as you can see from the slides and what we've talked about, um, there are multiple reasons for problems on a tomato. The most important thing is get some identification and help. And that's what a master gardener can do for you. Find out if you live in the metro area, you can use the helpline by calling these numbers or you can just Google uh, uh, and get on site. But you wanna get some identification and remedy before you uh, determine what the solution is. Again, don't add something that's not needed. Well, we can also have insects that want to move in. Um, we encourage people to not use an all-purpose, all system-wide uh, insecticide. It will kill the good bugs as well as the worst, the, the ones you're trying to get rid of. So we don't wanna harm the beneficial insects. Uh, a broad spectrum pesticide will do that. And, and so we don't want to use that. We encourage up rather that you get out there regularly and see the problem before it becomes severe. Here's a ton of aphids that have grown kind of out of control there that could be sprayed off with water. But um, regular observation, you can stay ahead of it. Keep your tomato branches off the ground. Remember, we don't want to give them an avenue to just climb up and get onto the plant. And you can plant some things around it that'll attract beneficial insects that will help care for your tomatoes and will also uh, detract what uh, uh, and confuse sometimes insect pests. These daisy-like flowers are good ones to plant around your tomatoes. Well, steps you can take to prevent problems on your tomato. Start, first of all, start with a healthy, disease-free plant. Stake them so that you get good air circulation to the fruit. Water at the base of the plant. Now remember, overhead watering is going to spread disease. Water in the morning or midday to minimize the amount of time that the plant would be wet. Monitor the plants often to check for pests. I, I love the saying that, um, one of the best prevent tools for prevention of plant of pests in your on your plants is the shadow of the gardener, meaning that you're out there standing and checking every day or as often as possible, checking to see what is going on in your garden. Because if you catch it early, you can solve a lot of problems. Be sure that you're using the fertilizer as recommended, one to two to one. Remember that ratio. Avoid working on the plants when the leaves or the fruit is wet, because as you walk around them, you'll just pick up things uh, from each plant and carry it on your clothing to the next plant. So avoid that. 
and remove and destroy affected plants at the end of the season, very important. And figure out how you can rotate your crops. Now, harvesting your tomatoes. We've got almost to the end of the season. How are we gonna get them so that we do get them uh, ripe in time to enjoy? Remember that tomatoes need warmth, not light, but they need warmth to ripen. And the optimal temperature is 68 to 77. We can't always control that, but be aware that cooler or warmer temperatures can slow the ripening. Well, to hasten ripening, what can we do? We can start at the very beginning of the season to mulch the plant. Do this two to three weeks after planting because we don't want to cool the soil, but if you keep the soil warm, you can promote earlier ripening. So add that mulch. And if you decide to use a plastic mulch, then you're uh, even further ahead. In August, reduce what you're doing for watering and fertilizing, especially anything when the way that might have nitrogen and keeps the plant growing. You want to see that you can't stress the plant a little bit. Uh, also, remember that if you're going to go out and pick a tomato, you don't want to water that shortly before because it will go right up into the tomato and dilute the flavor of the tomato. So in August, I stop actually stop watering. Uh, it is sometimes a little hard to think about, but the plant is developed by then and all the tomatoes are on there. And if I stop watering, I will get tomatoes ripening sooner. I also remove flower clusters at the end because they, will, they won't uh, have time to develop and small fruits or suckers, they are also gonna be uh, removed because at the end of the season, they're not gonna make it and all they do is uh, stress the plant and take the energy away. Well, I hope you've uh, been able to uh, learn something and helping you with growing your tomatoes and uh, getting to a successful season. I want to uh, let you know that there's a couple of things that you could uh, go back and learn. If you have, haven't bought your tomato plant yet, then you can go to this, one of my previous um, webinars, where I talk about the varieties of various uh, tomatoes, largely focusing on what you have room for, what you wanna use them for, uh, and that, that's helpful. That was uh, toward the beginning of that particular webinar. And then one thing I, I didn't have time for today, but is in a discussion that I did last year at this particular webinar is discussion of companion planting or planting partner, partners. And that what that means is that are there things that you can plant around your uh, tomato, uh, stressing getting biodiversity uh, and some other plants may help repel insects that would come and get to your tomato and some will attract good beneficial insects that will help your tomato grow. So those are the links and they will be available. Of course, remember this is a recorded session so you can uh, access that. Resources, uh, the extension has wonderful uh, publications for you. You can see here to help you uh, also the, the helpline, the Master Gardener helpline. Uh, there are handouts from 10 Minute University all these things we talked about today, again, from this website. And here are the resources that I used for uh, my program today. And you'll be available uh, to reach those at the end, uh, when the, especially when it's recorded and you have time to look at it. So I want to follow up finally by reminding you heard earlier in the session before we began that this weekend is the Spring Garden Fair. Saturday and Sunday at the Clackamas County Fairgrounds. And if you haven't got your tomato purchased, there you're going to find hundreds of varieties there. Wonderful. Vendors have so much to sell there and help you. And they're there to answer questions as well as master gardeners, as well as soil testing. So come learn about plants and get some garden tools and garden ideas. We have whole, uh, over 120 vendors. So our uh, Finishing up here, and I'm going to invite my co-host Priscilla to come and um, join. Happy gardening to everyone, and uh, we'll see you in the garden. Outstanding. Thank you, Amelia. Even uh, though you've presented so much information, there were some really good questions that came through. Okay. And um, one of them goes to all gardeners planting in the garden, planting in a raised bed, planting in a pot. What would you say the major 
cultural differences are for those three categories. And a lot of the questions came from watering and from um, like mulching. So yeah, they, just, they are different environments. They're in contrast. Okay, so a pot is going to dry out very fast. Uh, so that's something that you would put mulch even on the top of the pot, but you do need to water much more frequently than what we talked about in this in the seminar here. Um, you know, you can kind of do a finger probe and make sure that the water is uh, is plentiful. But you know, tomatoes. I want to say I, I heard this from a professional grower says they love to be flooded and they love the drought, flood and drought, so that you want to water deep and and a lot, and then let it dry out a little bit so the soil isn't just soaky let it dry and then you can water it again so i would say nutrition so the fertilization is a challenge in a smaller pot as well as the watering uh, you still quite often need to stake at, in, in a pot um, and same with the bed you know those are different environments the open garden the water is usually an easier to control because it, you have so much more soil Does that right. make anything add on that priscilla um, then just someone said, well, I would like to use grass clippings. And so do they need those grass clippings to dry out before applying as a mulch or can they be applied um, fresh? And I'm assuming that the clippings don't have herbicides on um, them. Yes, you want to make sure that you're, you're using uh, clean. You're not mixing it into the ground. It's a mulch. So you don't have to worry about it being decomposed like you would um, if you were mixing it down in. But uh, because it would rob rob some of the nutrients and uh, some nutrients. But anyway, uh, I've used both fresh. I just want to make sure that, uh, like you say, they, I haven't got an herbicide or I don't have weeds. And of course, my lawn has weeds, so I don't generally do that. That's but, a good point. Uh, <laughs> you too. Yeah. So, but but yes, grass clippings can be used. Uh, just keep it away from the stem. Remember, we don't want it touching up on the stem. Right. Uh, the other uh, cluster of questions came with people saying, oops, I've already put my tomatoes in the ground. What are some of their options? You mean they didn't, well, did they plant it? Or I guess they the plant, question, they're, they're they, planted and they're in the ground. And they, are they concerned that they didn't plant it deep enough? Is that No, I think they're, they're worried because most of us, you know, probably the soil was not warm enough. Oh. We're still having cool evenings. Uh, what are the practices? Oh, they can, they, if the plants are still looking okay, they can start covering them. Put a hoop around them or a cloche. There's lots of different covering uh, that you, they're available, but I would just get it covered. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so um, one person mentioned that their uh, plants are, aren't in the ground yet and they're getting very leggy. Uh, what should they do with those tomato plants while they wait? Well, if they could pot it up to a bigger pot, they could bury it deep, and that would reduce the legginess, the stem. But also, if if that happens, you know, that's when you use want to use that trench planting because you can lay that long stem down in, and then kind of gently bring it up, remove some of the top leaves, and you're going to have a plant that'll only be this tall, whereas maybe it was this tall in the pot, but. Uh, First suggestion is it's still kind of early, pot it up in a bigger pot if you've got one. If not, plan on studying and, and doing the trans the trench planting. Yeah, take advantage of that nice long stem for developing new yeah. roots. Yeah, yeah, that's that is a you know, you, people say, oh dear, how am I going to do it? But just think of that whole stem is going to be roots. You're going to have a healthy plant. Yeah. Yeah. And then um some folks are starting to harden up their tomato plants to get into the ground because their soil's warming up. But they're curious, what about if we get a real rainy day, should they skip that day? Should they bring their plants in from that hardening process on a, on a bad weather day? That's a good question. Um, you, you know, it's going to be eventually out of the garden to get that, but that could be if you just started the hardening process, I'd say bring it in and give it a vacation from uh, from the elements. Uh, right. Especially the rain sometimes we get here beats down hard and it could actually break the plant. So uh, yeah, I would bring it in. It's okay if, if the plant gets a little vacation from the hardening off process. Yeah. 
That Same thing. Sense. And don't, I wouldn't put it all out overnight until just before you're ready to put it in the garden. I'd give it, start with just an hour or two a day, increasing slowly an hour or two a day until um, you're ready to leave it outdoors. But if it's the temperature goes below 50, don't leave it outdoors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think um, those are the, the questions that, oh, aside from commercial calcium, um, people were wondering if it's okay to use oyster shells or um, clam shells or even egg shells. And um, is that recommended at OSU or uh, do we have any real research on those products? Oh, um, I, I hear that a lot. Uh, I've, I've watched videos where they recommend crushing up your eggshells and putting them in. My question is, you have no idea the quantity of the lime that you're getting or the calcium. And so, um, you know, here we are recommending this one to two to one fertilizer. And when you start doing those kinds of additives and inputs that you don't have any idea, the ratio or the amount of the concentration, then uh, you run the risk of not addressing the issue as well. I think, you know, as Priscilla, I, I noticed that almost more than any other plant, tomato planting and growing is so susceptible to folklore and rumors and myths <laughs> of what to do. Oh, my dad did this, or, you know, this is it. it the question is, we, we, we teach from research-based evidence. Um, so. I can't say that eggshells don't add calcium, but I'd have no idea how much calcium you're putting in there. And, um, and if, you know, if you need it, uh, here's the other thing I don't know about when that breaks down, if you're trying to promote calcium getting up into your plant, will that be sufficient when you water it to bring it up? Um, all good questions. And, and the, the point is we do teach from evidence-based research. So I've never seen OSU recommend eggshells. Exactly. I was, some of us trying in, in the Q&A, they were saying, well, why can't I do that? And I'm like, well, you know, everything that we're recommending is from research base and OSU has not mentioned this right. and that, but um, I thought I'd ask you and, and I like, I like the answer. I think we're on the same page on that, Amelia, for sure. I just saw someone ask about growing under a porch. You know, tomatoes need six to eight hours of sunlight. So a covered porch, now maybe that's for hardening off. I'm not sure what the question was there, but they just said all I saw was under a covered porch. Remember, you want to get your, um, oh, yes, for the hardening. Yeah. Okay. So yes, a covered porch should be all right, but there it's, again, you're not getting all the elements. Um, if that was the rain or the wind you were concerned about, um, expose it gradually so that it can learn learn so that it can get so it tolerates that because when you put it out in the garden that's what it's going to have is yeah. rain and wind and you know what I even kind of mark it on my calendar how many minutes you know how many hours they've been because I, I lose track of it so you know give yourself some some documentation on your hardening off so that you you give them the full gamut before they get exposed to yes the garden a good uh, journal for your garden is always good Absolutely. Absolutely. I use a journal on my um, my phone just because I have my phone all the time and it's an easy way to get that information jotted down. Well, this is amazing. I was reading over your presentation last night, reviewing it, and my mouth was watering. I'm just ready. I'm ready to get my tomatoes in. I know I need to wait, but um, I anticipate a great growing season and your information is just so wonderful. And I remember um, your session, your, your tomatoes too, had some really good information on the different varieties. So if, if folks are out there looking and wondering, well, what, what varieties do I want for either the growing condition or the taste or the use, you were really comprehensive with that so yes and, and and unfortunately i can't cover that with now no. but it is good and that's why we've included the link that also that one link that takes you back to uh the number two session of this year will also uh gives a introduction to the concept of degree days when you can think about 
right. how much warmth does a tomato plant need? And that sometimes looking at that, you can say, well, I see why I need to wait or I'm putting a plant out too early and I just ex it just exposes it to uh, stress and pathogens. You know, yeah. that's, it's important. Not I, I think I have planted tomatoes in early May and I planted them in early June and middle of June. And would you believe by August, they're all about the same place. In fact, the one in early May isn't so good because it's not as healthy. Right. So I know we're anxious to get out there and put our plants in. But if you do, there's season extenders and that's addressed in the earlier webinar as well. So if you yeah. want to use season extenders, you sure can. But the main thing is to keep your, use the practices that we've talked about today to keep your plant healthy and you'll have a great harvest. Yeah. And I know that I'm going to be walking around at the spring garden fair, looking at all the unusual varieties of tomatoes that come with some of those smaller vendors, not the big box stores. So um, I'm, I'm really anxious to take a look and see what's available over at the Spring Garden Fair. And you also- know, You know, uh, uh, Priscilla, there are over 10,000 varieties to, of tomatoes. So it's fun. Try a new one this year, get to the Spring Garden Fair or, or if you're not in the area at your local uh, garden shop and try some new ones. Uh, if you're just where you're growing on a patio, you can easily grow a cherry tomato nicely in a pot or a determinant. I talk about that in the earlier session. So if people want to review that and the session on uh, companion plants, that's toward the end of that one. You'll see the link that I have for that. It's, it's toward the end of that particular webinar. Yep, there's so many things we can do in our garden and we just absorb this information little by little. And uh, each year, it, you know, we learn something new and, and maybe we're a little more successful. So that's what this, uh, these are all about. To, I'm uh, always, I'm always learning every year. I find something new that I say, didn't know that. So, yeah. uh, but you know, don't get discouraged because that's part of the process of learning and getting better is uh, even the master gardeners are keep learning. Absolutely. Well, I think that's just about a wrap. And next week we have our, let's see, we have the, the color in the, the garden, year round color in the garden. And that, so those of you who are not into vegetables, but into flowers, I think you're gonna like that um, webinar very much. And um, thank you so much, Amelia, for the research and presenting the information in a way that we can uh, take it home and, and put it in the garden. Oh, thank you, Priscilla. Thanks for accompanying me and happy gardening, everybody, and enjoy growing those tomatoes. All right, bye-bye.